The following is an in-depth story analysis. If you haven't seen The Americans, you may want to before watching this video. Top level scientists working on a program to save this country from nuclear weapons. And they don't have security, can you explain that? They feel safe here. Not for much longer. Born too late to explore the Earth, born too soon to explore the stars, or the really messed up parts of the ocean, but I was born just in time for the golden age of television. HBO's most notable dramas may have been a bit before my time, I'm not sure what a three-year-old slip maker would have thought of Oz, but these shows were just an incredible taste of things to come, whetting our appetites for the sudden deluge of quality and innovation that would be upon us. I'm on the record saying the golden age of television began with the seasons running during the 2007 Writers Guild of America strike, and roughly ended with the series finale of Hannibal. But that's more about the amount of of great shows all running concurrently. I'm not saying there weren't top tier shows running before and after. Instead, I'm admitting that those heady days were an embarrassment of riches. So many great shows, so little time, and dependable workhorses had the sad fate of often getting lost in the shuffle. I've made no secret of my contempt for the Dexter and Game of Thrones finales, but what can I offer as a rebuttal? What shows have run for half a dozen years and still had a barn burner of a series finale? Breaking Bad is my obvious pick, but as I dug around the internet, I saw the name of another finale bandied about. Start, the final episode of The American. Not only is it a six-year-long series with the finale held up as a masterpiece, the show itself is held up as one of the greatest things to ever air on the small screen. So is The Americans really an unsung masterpiece that flew under the radar like some sort of stealth bomber in the closing days of the Gilded Age of TV? Time to trust, but verify. Let's watch The Americans. The Americans is a Cold War spy drama set in Reagan-era United States. The series follows the exploits of two KGB spies in the Illegals program, Philip and Elizabeth Jennings. The two met in Moscow during training, got paired off like awkward lab partners, and were then shipped off to the cozy suburbs outside DC to get fake married and become fake parents to their two real kids, kids who have no knowledge of their parents' secret lives the perfect cover. With a nuclear family as a smokescreen, the Jennings parents can act with impunity behind enemy lines. When the center needs, they can tail, blackmail, steal, and seduce, commit character assassination, or just flat out assassinate. The first season sees the Jennings parents attempting to undermine President Reagan's Star Wars program. For the uninitiated, the Star Wars program was basically the 80s equivalent of Israel's modern day missile defense Iron Dome, except American taxpayers were expected to pay for it. Oh wait, I forgot, we paid for both. Anyway, long story short, Star Wars the defense system never worked. Which which immediately throws you for a loop when you're a new viewer watching The Americans. Is the show like Inglorious Bastards, where the leads are capable of completely rewriting history? Is the show like Boardwalk Empire, where the leads are injected right into history and history sort of morphs around to accommodate them? Or is the show like Mad Men, where history remains exactly the same, but we learn these characters secretly played a part in it? And I guess that's my main criticism of the first season of The Americans. The writers throw you into the deep end and leave you to figure out which way is up. Case in point is keeping track of the characters, who is here for our one-off capers of the week, and who who is going to factor into the larger arcs of the series. The show's first resident hero falls victim to a frame job early in season one, but he turns up again an entire season later. I thought that dude was dead. We meet Annalise, a woman Philip is hooking up with whom he dupes into working for him in the second episode of the show. We won't see her again for another 21 episodes, but when she comes back, she is the catalyst of an entire storyline. Then there's characters like Irina, Philip's ex, who reveals she secretly had Philip's child after Philip left Russia. She and Philip have sex, an affair which sparks a major rift between he and Elizabeth. So surely Irina will be an important character going forward. Except she isn't. Irina never comes back. The benefit is that this structure creates an intricate and tangled web of allegiances and possible casualties. Just be aware that unless you've got an uncanny ability to put names to faces, you might feel like you need to make one of those giant conspiracy boards to keep track of it all. It's not the kind of show you watch drunk. I, um, I killed someone. You did what you had to do. For what? I mean, what was the point? For some X's and O's on a virtual highway? I don't even know what that means. Another way the show throws you in the deep end, the exact dynamics between the Jennings parents is wishy-washy from square one. While the trials and tribulations they face on the romantic, familial, and undercover fronts are all engaging in their own right, the through line of their relationship in the first season is a bit hard to grasp. This began as a fake spy relationship, just like the series Chuck, so the immediate question is, has this relationship become real, and this season is about their love hitting the rocks, or has it all been a lie and this season is about exploring their true feelings for each other? It seems to shift between the two from episode to episode. I 
want a good bedrock so that I feel it when the show decides to shake the foundations. I don't want to think both characters are in a romantic farce where one misunderstanding leads to the next until you just wish they'd kiss already. That being said, the payoff at the end of the season is strong, and it's a baseline the show will work with going forward. We also have a lot of fun with the dynamics between the two. Elizabeth is the true believer, and Philip is the cynic who mistrusts his own government. He seems to like America, but is it just an appreciation he picked up because his kids are able to lead happier childhoods than him? And can he be trusted to support the cause, or is he going native, so to speak? You loved it here, and you started loving it more and more. Now look what finally happened! I fit in! I fit in like I'm supposed to. Rather than playing this the typical way, the Americans inverts it. You'd think when the USSR betrays their trust, Philip would shout, see, I'm right, and Elizabeth would blindly defend her home country. Instead, we get to explore Elizabeth's emotions as the scales fall from her eyes, while at the same time, Matthew Reeves can sell, with an expert, understated performance, that... Yeah, this is the kind of shit he's just come to expect from the USSR. Not to mention the chemistry between the two is absolute dynamite. And I know I'm not the only one who thinks that. The two leads popped out a kid together in 2016. I'm glad I was able to call it this time. My friend showed me a web series called Video Game High School a while back, and I was like, yeah, it's kind of goofy fun, but I just don't buy the romance between the two leads. And he said, well, yeah, they actually got married in real life. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. The cases of the week are low-key, but still quite a bit of fun. Fun being a relative term, I'm the kind of sicko who is enthralled by the emotional turmoil of a bug planting plan that involves poisoning an innocent housekeeper's son. Maybe engaging is a better word. But don't worry, it's very simple. Do as I say, he gets better, one, two. No, no, you give it to him now. Give it to him now, give him the antidote now! Longtime viewers will know Better Call Saul is my favorite series, and this show makes equal hay with the meticulous nature of the caper. If you're the kind of person who gets a fun little tickle in your brain whenever a crime thriller explores the scrupulous detail of pulling off a crime, you'll be right at home watching The Americans. It's an absolute feast of that kind of material. Granted, the visual direction is much more workmanlike, especially in the first couple seasons. It's certainly not a bad-looking show, but The Americans rarely indulges in the sort of visual flair as Better Call Saul does. On the other hand, I can't remember the last time Saul Goodman and Kim West Wexler played hot potato with a rival lawyer's trigger bomb so that they would unwittingly blow themselves up. Incredible. As much as the show delivers on the heist, caper, and scheme front, there are one or two episodes that don't quite hit the mark. Almost everyone I've spoken to was confused by the first few minutes of the pilot, because again, the writers drop you in the deep end. Later, there's a harebrained scheme to frame a guy for rape by drugging him, but first staging a mugging after already having the woman seduce him drugless anyways, and the details are kept from the audience for the duration of the episode, Ocean's Eleven style. Fair enough. There was an element of Ocean's Eleven where you're like, is this part of a plan, or are they actually in huge trouble? But with this episode, we don't even know the basic details of the plan, so I'm just assuming Philip has the situation completely under control the whole time which he does. And then there's the episode where Philip and Elizabeth are exposed by the U.S. government and interrogated. Yeah, they got found out in episode six? Mm-hmm, sure. This is all some sort of loyalty test. I will reiterate, these are exceptions. Mostly the show nails things, even when historical circumstances would seemingly deflate the tension. There's an early episode where they enter a panicky frenzy after Reagan gets shot. Is this one of us? Is this a coup? Despite knowing from US history that it was just some random nutter, the episode is still a tense watch. Elizabeth almost blows her own face off with a booby trap in her sniper rifle drop box. And while I dragged the faking your cover being blown plot a second ago, the story runs parallel to the Jennings being unable to pick their kids up from school as a result of the scheme, which leads to the kids hitching a ride home with a very creepy individual. So even when the Americans has a rare miss on the spy storyline, it usually parlays it into a thrilling subplot on the family front. We're no better than wild dogs. <laughs> The least thrilling element of the spycraft is definitely the sexual one. The Americans will explore a more nuanced, challenging, and downright uncomfortable look into the sexual exploitation of vulnerable or perverted people as the series progresses, but in the first season, it's by the numbers of James Bond fair. Horny men will always pick Elizabeth out of a crowd as their sexual target so she can exploit them. It doesn't seem to depend all that much on their social interactions, only how smoking hot she is. It feels like it was written by me in high school before I got my dick wet. Well, she's just pretty, so she can do whatever, and anybody will want to fuck her instantly and give up government secrets to her. That makes sense. The show will start to explore the nuances of romantic exploitation starting next season, but for the first 13 episodes, being hot is an I win button. 
even in the world of trained espionage agents. Although one positive note when it comes to sex, FX wasn't allowed to air anything full frontal, but they certainly had the M.O. It's fine from behind. Sex position heavy shows like Game of Thrones are all cocks and boobs, but the Americans knew what it could get away with and steered into the skid. No pun intended. This may be the most ass heavy show in the universe. My anaconda don't want none unless you got buns, hun. We get the gender flip of the seduction dynamics with Philip and frumpy FBI secretary Martha. Philip poses as an internal FBI investigator to pump Martha for information, literally. Initially interviewing Martha as part of his supposed job, before seducing her and ultimately eloping with her. While the men who Elizabeth exploits are all inevitably BDSM obsessed pervs, poor Martha is just a lonely girl in a lonely job who thinks she's finally found a good man, her very own Superman, ironically reflected in Philip's chosen pseudonym, Clark. Wait a second. Clark and Martha. Why did you say that name? <laughs> oh, it never gets old. Philip is in a more morally ambiguous situation. The things Philip is willing to open up about to Martha and to Elizabeth, lying to both of them in his own way, are messy and complicated. It's the sickest Betty and Veronica relationship ever put on television and will continue to be one of the strongest storylines throughout the series. Thank you. <laughs> On the less compelling side, we have Stan Beeman, FBI agent and neighbor to the Jennings family. Married man Stan starts having a fling with bombshell Nina Sergeyevna, a Russian KGB agent he has dirt on. This storyline, in the first season at least, bores me. To be fair, I've been watching people have affairs in the 20s and the 40s and the 50s, and now that I'm here in the 80s, it all feels run-of-the-mill. More than run-of-the-mill, it's, it's contrived. The writers want to mine emotional drama from an FBI agent banging his KGB informant, but they don't know how to write the origin of the relationship really. Realistically, it feels forced. The better choice would probably have been to play things like Mad Men. When we first meet Stan in the pilot, just show him already knees deep in the affair with his informant. Let the audience fill in the history. The writers instead explore the origin of it and it's hard to buy. It also plays into a larger problem the first season has, which is that Stan comes across as kind of an asshole. If the show were going for a Nelson Van Aldeny, the investigators are also evil theme, that might work, but they aren't. Instead, the character of Stan is just a walking contradiction. According to the show, he's a former undercover guy who never shook the horrors he saw while investigating white supremacists. He's supposedly paranoid of everyone he meets, but also falls head over heels for Nina, obvious master temptress. He's scarred by the horrors undercover work put him through, but reacts with absolute horror when he learns Nina put out to get information. How did you get him to talk? He sucked his cock, just like you told me to. I never said that. I, ne I never said that. Nina, Jesus. Then to cap it all off, he remorselessly kills some Soviet embassy intern in an act of senseless vengeance later in the season. Stan and his whole department will eventually be taken to task for this the following season, but really, it's pretty despicable. And it's weird because Stan's not the character the show wants you to think Stan is. Noah Emmerich turns in a great performance as the neighbor you always dream of having. He's an oversharer, but a fast friend, fiercely sympathetic while being emotionally checked out himself. He's one of the best parts of the show and sort of becomes the moral foundation of the series going forward. He'll work within the law when possible, but step outside it to risk his own career or life when he needs to. Anything to do the right thing, not according to his country, but according to his own moral code, which is why it's so weird that in season one, Stan is such a scumbag. I will personally send you his balls to wear around your neck at your next May Day parade. The climax of season one is a thrill ride. Elizabeth and Philip have to run two missions in tandem. One will go on an easy peasy lemon squeezy dead drop pickup, while the other has to go on a risky mission to meet a potential US military defector. There's a lot of relationship drama mined from the two arguing over which of the two will take the risky mission, only amplified by dramatic irony when the audience learns that the dead drop mission is a giant death trap and not easy peasy lemon squeezy at all. It'll be easy peasy lemon squeezy. No, it won't. It will be difficult, difficult, lemon difficult. The situation is so dire that the Russian embassy resorts to spray painting the mission abort code on every single employee's car, then driving them all around DC and praying to Mother Russia the agents will see it. It's a desperate final play as everyone's backs are to the wall, and ends in a wild shootout and car chase that feels like some classic spy thriller material. It's so awesome. 
but a word of warning to new viewers, enjoy it while it lasts. The Americans develops a taste for understated, anticlimactic finales and never goes for this sort of action-heavy payoff again. As emotionally impactful as future finales are, the Jennings family learn their lesson after this and keep themselves insulated from do-or-die situations as much as possible going forward. The journey may have been a bit directionless from time to time, but the Americans ultimately lines up all the dominoes for a fantastic follow-up season. Stan and his wife finally have a falling out over his lies, Philip and Elizabeth reconnect, Nina becomes a double agent for the Soviets, and the Jennings daughter Paige starts to look into the strange personal lives of her parents. This is all capped off with a montage set to Peter Gabriel's Games Without Frontiers, just one song in the stellar playlist of more eclectic 80s hits that composes the soundtrack. I appreciate the more out-there music choices that the Americans will occasionally indulge in. So many 80s period pieces roll with a now that's what I call music from the 80s bundle of standards, but the Americans fleshes out the time period with a mix of hits, deep cuts, and stuff that aged strangely. It feels more authentic and transports you to the time period without being too distracting. Maybe a pleb to your take, but that's all I got on the music. Sorry it's not more in depth. I know I'm not Anthony Fantano. I thank God for that fact every day. So that's it for season one. With their most dangerous mission yet under their belt, the Jennings are in the mood for a nice little vacation, but they can't insulate themselves from everything, as we learn when we meet back up with them in season two. The through line of season one was supposedly uncovering and sabotaging the Star Wars missile defense program, but as we learned in the finale, it was all a wild goose chase. The American government knew how to make Star Wars work about as well as Ryan Johnson. By definitively setting up a season end game during the premiere, the American season two immediately thrives due to having a strong sense of direction and impending narrative payoff. Collaborating with another married couple in the illegals program, the Connors, the two families pull off a simple mission, then spend the weekend at an amusement park with their kids. As the trip winds down, the Jennings and the Connors' son, Jared, discover the rest of the Connors brutally murdered in their hotel room. Who did this? Why did they do it? And how did they find out who this family really was? Season two of The Americans invites you, if you dare, to solve their murders. That doesn't hook you enough. The capers of the week all tie together with more purpose, too. The Soviets want to recreate the American stealth bomber program, so they need the holy trinity of the 80s aeronautical world. The radar-proof paint, the echo computer program, and scientist Anton Baklanov. The father, the son, and the holy spirit. Oh yeah, and they need to bug the ARPANET. So I guess that's like the Pope. The abduction and deportation of Anton Baklanov is probably the nastiest scheme we've sent Philip on since the clock back in season one. You're a monster. <laughs> You're not a man. Whatever you once were, whoever you were, they trained it out of you. Then on top of that, we have both Philip and Elizabeth pimping out someone who trusts them in the name of their mission. On the whole, the seduction dynamics of season two are much more nuanced than the first. Instead of being an I win button, we've got Elizabeth pulling off some emotional exploitation while keeping it in her pants. Philip's ally Annalise is disgusted when she realizes what he's turned her into. Meanwhile, Elizabeth's ally Lucia is pretty cool with it. She's like, damn, let's keep the love train rolling. But since apparently the 80s were just one giant nightmare for everybody, her next assignment is to kill her lover. Womp womp. So again, the sexual dynamics of the series took a big step in the right direction going into season two. Points deducted, though, for the sheer volume of scenes where someone has a traumatizing mission, then some sort of tender snuggling session afterwards. Yes, human affection is life affirming. I got it. And scene. Cut. Just cut whenever. What, was the episode running a few minutes short, so they just threw in some B-roll of Carrie and Matthew making out on set? And when it comes to lovebirds, we gotta talk about Stan and Nina. Since Nina has admitted her betrayal to the Residentura and is now working as a turncoat, she's tasked with getting Stan the man to turn over stealth information to the Russians. Nina hatches a scheme with the cocky new science and technology officer Oleg Gorovich Burov. I'm a feminist, Nina. I work only on the Oleg is the non-comedic version of Dan Egan from Veep. He's handsome and smarmy, and constantly hatching schemes with absolute confidence. Schemes that all inevitably end in failure, but never shake his confidence that he can pull off one next season. Oleg will pretend to discover Nina's already confessed betrayal, then threaten to send her to the gulag unless Stan can give him something worthwhile. Oleg and Nina start hooking up, and much to their horror, they realize they're going to have to do some forced method acting. If this plan doesn't pay off, 
Nina really is getting shipped off to the Gulag. I was pretty down on the dynamic between Stan and Nina in Season 1 because it all felt a little forced and out of character for both of them. But Season 2 goes beyond just assuming viewers buy into their love. The writers actually put in some decent legwork to retroactively justify the feelings between the pair, an effort I genuinely appreciated. They want to answer the questions like, why would Stan think this is real? Why would he trust her? What makes him so compelled to gravitate toward Nina in particular? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, considering his background as an undercover agent and the, the baggage that comes with. You know, beyond just the obvious, she has an absurdly pretty face. We also even get a minor emotional retcon of Stan's wanton murder from last season. Last year, they twisted the knife by revealing, oh, that guy you murdered out of blind vengeance? It was actually a total sweetheart. He, he never did a thing to hurt America. He was a kid out of his depth, and he was going to be a doctor. He was one day away from retirement. They got the full-on Abby Anderson treatment. Then in season two, they make up for it with a funny little scene where Stan's boss, Agent Gad, gets guilt-tripped by the Residentura for being complicit in the victim's death. And Gad basically tells his KG be accuser to go fuck the dog. Would have washed out in a year. Didn't have the stomach for the trade. He wanted to be a doctor. He should have been a doctor. All in all, the second season of The Americans is a party on the small screen and everyone's invited. There's only one plotline that's a tad mishandled. Daughter Paige continues her suspicions of her parents' personal lives, and for the first half of the season, it's solid stuff. The Jennings have to call in another agent to pinch hit as their distant relative, and then they engineer an awkward catching your parents in the act moment in an effort to deter Paige from snooping around the house. At least, I think that's what they were doing. Hope your cover story travel agent jobs have plenty of family therapy on the health insurance package. Then Paige takes the advice of Bully McGuire and gets religion. Knowing where the show is going next season, this is effective groundwork. In season three, Philip and Elizabeth will be tasked with recruiting Paige into the illegals program, making her a spy just like them. They'll have to attempt to parlay her quest for meaning through Christ into a quest for meaning through glorious Mother Russia, utilizing the liberal causes her church champions as a bridge. But like I said, this is groundwork material, not dominate the runtime material. And for much of the middle of season two, Paige's conversion to Christianity and her parents' handling of it does dominate the runtime. The Americans is a show that's as much about the struggles of marriage and raising children as it is about spycraft. But come on. For season two, the familial drama is heightened, but of little consequence in the grand scheme of things. It has a habit of falling into the people shouting is drama trap. You respect Jesus, but not us! And since Elizabeth will run point on recruiting Paige in season three, Philip's hot-headedness this season ultimately just gets swept under the rug. But what about that oh-so-enticing murder mystery that frames the season? Now that is an absolute goldmine. Philip and Elizabeth have to wrestle with the paranoia of their own family being in danger, only accentuated by the survival of the Connors' traumatized son, Jared. There's an effective red herring in the form of a sad sack American stealth program member, who knew the Connors but never has the eye of suspicion cast on him after their death. So astute audience members will likely finger him as the culprit, but no. Then there's the obvious red herring, Lyric. Lyric is a ruthlessly efficient Navy SEAL who the Connors were blackmailing by exploiting his homosexuality. He's the deadliest threat the Jennings have faced yet. Professional codebreaker, expert combatant, and he's gay, which makes him like a ground type to Elizabeth's previously unstoppable electric love. The Jennings enter into a plotline with him that's reminiscent of the Trinity Killer season of Dexter, aka how long can we leave this devious killer alive and mine information from him before he finds out who we are and murders our family. Hello, Elizabeth Jennings. The town they lived in, cars they drove, the fact that they were married. I was two or three meetings from finding their home address. A mission that results in unexpected civilian casualties leads Lyric to seek revenge, and in the span of a few episodes, he starts to extrajudicially dismantle the KGB's illegals operation in DC, with the ultimate intention of capturing the Jennings family alive. It's edge of your seat stuff, and serves as a giant shot of adrenaline during the season's final few hours. That being said, a part of me wishes this was more of a season-long thing. Watching Lyric slowly pull the thread of the KGB sweater until all that's left is the Jennings parents, utterly exposed, is thrilling material. Instead, it's all sort of crammed into a season-ending two-parter. But boy, oh boy, is that two-parter awesome. But like I said, when it comes to the murder of the Connors, Lyric is only a red herring. The killer is revealed as Jared, the Connors' own son. After falling in love with their handler, a dynamic that is creepy enough in its own right given his age, he turned the gun on his KGB parents and his unaware sister when they attempted to steer him away from their line of work. It all happens so fast that the true horror of his motivation and actions doesn't really sink in until you ruminate on it. Yeah, it's some creepy, creepy shit. And Jared's actor brings it home as his personality eerily shifts away from the shattered youth we've come to know him as. As if that horror weren't enough for the Jennings, they are informed shortly after that since Jared, you know, didn't work out on account of the whole murdering his family thing, 
Paige is the next contestant. That's for us to decide. Paige is your daughter, but she's not just yours. She belongs to the cause. Philip tries to exert control, tries to protect his children, but the political and power dynamics are all too clear. What the center wants, the center gets. And Elizabeth isn't nearly as opposed to this plan as Philip is. Paige will become a Soviet asset. Or murder her whole family trying. Buckle up, Philip. You're about to have a painful season three. The Americans does not hide for a single second that season three is intended to horrify Philip at the prospect of forcing his daughter into his line of work. He's got to fold the corpse of his informant Annalise into a suitcase by shattering her bones. Then Elizabeth catches a shattered tooth during an altercation with the FBI, so he's got to pull the chip pieces out of her infected gums with some pliers out in the garage. The only injury equally skin-crawlingly, painfully down-to-earth I've ever seen on television is the infected buckshot in Lester's hand from the first season of Fargo. We've gone beyond the Incredibles level... I don't want the kids in my line of work because they'll be in danger. We're really showing just how nasty and not so glamorous this life is. I don't want her putting people into a suitcase, and I don't want her ending up in a suitcase. Don't you dare. I what would do never you put her in this position. Happen? What do you think will happen? The show also accentuates the more uncomfortable aspects of the sexual manipulations the Jennings parents engage in. We've always had the callous exploitation of poor FBI secretary Martha, but now we've got a second uncomfortable Philip seduction as he is tasked with enticing the underage daughter of a CIA director who was the same age as Paige. There's a deeply disturbing episode capper where Philip watches his underage target Kimmy dance to Yaz's Only You, the album he just bought his own daughter for her birthday. Thank God this show aired on FX, a network willing to explore the horrific nature of being saddled with such a task in the name of your country. If this was a Netflix original, they'd probably try and pitch it to you as just another cool benefit of being a spy. On the Stan and Oleg front, true to form, Oleg's plot to get Stan Beeman to sell out his country for Nina ended in failure. Welcome to the Gulag. If you survive, you earn your freedom. Oleg goes to kick a bullet in Stan's head in a crime of passion, but Stan passes the speech check and lives to see another day. Stan later approaches Oleg with a harebrained scheme of his own to unmask a Russian defector as a double agent, then get the FBI to trade her in exchange for Nina's freedom. Sounds like a hell of a plan, Stan. I'm sure this won't end in complete disaster. The first few episodes of the season are masterpieces of tension. The direction has never been stronger. The confrontation between Stan and Oleg is pretty visually striking, and Stan's slow walk away as he anticipates a gunshot to the back still put me on the edge of my seat, even though I knew in the back of my mind Stan would live to amaze another day. Screw you, Oleg. You want to shoot me? Shoot me in the back. There's a nail-biting episode where Philip and Elizabeth realize they're being tailed and have to engineer a way to ditch the combined manpower of the FBI and the CIA. The score incorporates this pulsing heartbeat feel that continues to drum on even after Elizabeth pulls off her final getaway. Then you've got the aforementioned human suitcase origami and Orin Scrivello dental segment, the latter of which left my face contorted in a wince for almost a minute. Estmen, Baggage, and Open House are a hat trick. Three standout episodes to get the audience hooked for the season to come. After the tailing in Mr. Brezhnev's Wild Ride, the Americans decides to pump the brakes on the action. The rest of the season trades on paranoia, which is what the Cold War was really all about, Charlie Brown. Stan bets his professional career on a dangerous gamble that their Soviet defector is too good to be true, and the series finally makes hay with the suspicious, distrustful personality Stan was set up with in the pilot. And when the bug Philip got Martha to plant is discovered, her entire world begins to unravel. The danger she's in is only amplified when the internal investigator that gets called in is not her husband, which leaves her wondering, who the hell did I marry? I met a man named Walter Taffet yesterday. Who's he? Well, he's you. And to cap it all off, Nina is offered a series of missions within the prison to socially manipulate other inmates into giving up intel in exchange for her freedom. We've got Martha suspicious of her husband, Stan suspicious of his source, Philip suspicious of his handler, Paige suspicious of her parents, the FBI suspicious of everyone within their own office, tie all this paranoia up in a nice little ribbon with direction at an all-time high, some clutch soundtrack picks, and the cast and writers really settling into these characters' grooves, and it's no wonder season three is held up as the year the Americans really hit its stride. I'm not going to entirely disagree. When the show is capitalizing on the paranoia, backstabbing, and second guessing, it's a joy to watch. But there's also a lot of times you wonder when the Americans is just gonna get to the fireworks factory, especially when the show spends major chunks of runtime on est seminars, the socio-political Soviet ongoings overseas, or a whole bottle episode devoted to an old lady blathering on about her life before she gets killed by Elizabeth for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I tied an onion to my belt! 
which was the style at the time. No, to take the ferry cost a nickel. Maybe I was just overhyped for this episode, since Do Male Robots Dream of Electric Sheep was touted as a series highlight and even earned the series its first Emmy nom for outstanding writing. But I was unimpressed. An innocent person is in the wrong place at the wrong time and ends up a casualty of the Jennings. This is ground we've covered before. I would argue covered more effectively, and much, much quicker. The Americans is spinning a bunch of storyline plates, and they all start to wobble as season three progresses, priming the audience for everything to come crashing to the ground in spectacular, dramatic fashion. Is Philip's relationship with underage Kimmy going to come to a pervy head? Will Stan's antics compromise the careers and lives of himself and his co-workers? Will Nina pull off her stay of execution? Will the Eye of Suspicion drive Martha to turn in her husband, or simply crack under the pressure herself? Well. Sadly, you're going to have to wait until Season 4 for all of those storylines to reach their grand, horrifying payoffs. Season 3 is all set up, no payoff, which is sometimes a slow-burning, deliberate choice and sometimes just frustrating. When are they going to get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> In my sleep... I have nightmares about living in a world where the Americans was canceled after season three, and I wake in a cold sweat. All these plot lines left up in the air would have been lost to fucking time. I mean, I guess Stan's tit-for-tat prisoner exchange plot actually does come to fruition, only for it to be kicked upstairs so a more valuable asset than Nina can be extracted instead. But that still leaves Nina on the bubble. It's a resolution that's oddly satisfying in how profoundly dissatisfying it is. It's a day of big disappointments for all of us. The one and only plotline that truly comes to a head is Paige. How do you fix a problem like Paige? The Jennings are getting squeezed on both sides to reveal the truth to her. The center is demanding she be recruited. Meanwhile, Paige's mounting suspicions demand answers. Master manipulator that she is, you'd figure Elizabeth would do a slightly better job priming her daughter for the revelation, but this is not her best work in the art of social engineering. Maybe that's the point. The Jennings parents can play anybody except for their own daughter. Keeping in line with the understated nature of the season, Paige doesn't learn her parents' secrets in a do-or-die scenario where she gets tangled up with enemy spies and her life is on the line. Schlocky fun as that may have been, that's not the tone the series wants to go for. Instead, one night she comes home, puts her foot down about all the weirdness going on, then Philip and Elizabeth just cave and tell her. Obviously, they don't tell her everything. They don't come right out and say, hey, we both iced more people than Freddy Krueger and about half of them were bystanders. Instead, they spin the narrative that they're civil rights activists, invoking the Soviet Union's involvement in the anti-apartheid movement and obvious vested interest in U.S. nuclear disarmament. And apartheid for one, and slow down the nuclear arms race, stop terrorism, and world hunger. This is a fun direction for the show to head in. They aren't actually coming clean to their daughter, they're just spinning an entirely new web of lies to recruit her. I just wish the Jennings and the show were more committed to the bit. The agents have the capacity to conjure up fake relatives and friends, an ability they will exploit next season to convince someone their goals and actions are moral. But they don't use it on Paige. I mean, you'd imagine they'd be staging fake missions and shit and letting Paige overhear it. Sorry, your father is out tonight. He had to save a bunch of children from an orphanage Ronald Reagan set on fire. Then Paige goes, oh my god, maybe I was wrong. Maybe my parents' cause is a righteous one. Instead, they continue to act super clandestine and untrustworthy around Paige, which naturally collapses her trust in them and leads to our cliffhanger. Paige calls up her good friend and religious mentor, Pastor Tim, and spills the beans. They're Russians. How are the Jennings going to get out of this mess without losing their daughter's trust for good? And what will happen in all the other plot lines that didn't get resolved at all. Tune in next season to find out. It takes about 48 hours for Elizabeth to figure out that Paige unmasked her to Pastor Tim, thanks in part to tapping all her daughter's conversations, but also because a frazzled Paige confesses. So now there's this one giant loose end that the Jennings can't get rid of in the typical fashion, lest they lose Paige's trust forever. The center hatches a goofy scheme to send the Jennings family to Epcot. <laughs> goofy scheme. Little accidental joke there for you. While the family is away, another agent will take out Pastor Tim and his wife and make it look like an accident. And the Jennings parents are like, what are you fucking stupid? You think Paige isn't going to put two and two together? But that's a risk the center is willing to take, even though losing Paige means this whole risky idea to recruit her goes up in smoke. Yet another mission that fails and ends in wanton casualties to cover up the attempt. It's been a running theme throughout the series, but really comes to the forefront this season. The Jennings are willing, or rather commanded, to risk their own lives and the lives of their informants in pursuit of goals that either fail or are ultimately of zero use to the cause. They go to all that 
blood effort to steal submarine propellers in season two, only for the engineers back home to miss obvious design flaws and sink the subs with soldiers on board. They risk Martha's life and end the old ladies to bug the male robot in season three, only for the resident Tura to offhandedly comment that nobody ever says anything of importance near the male robot. And now the effort to recruit Paige is at risk of getting mothballed as a consequence of the center demanding they rush it. The damning track record of the center that makes you never want to trust their judgment again is made all the more horrifying by the central spy plot of the season. William, a lone undercover agent who's been behind enemy lines even longer than the Jennings, has worked his way through the ranks at a biological research center over the last 25 years. He's now tasked with stealing samples of the scariest pathogens he can get his hands on. Glanders, think COVID-19 but with a 50% mortality rate, and Lassa fever, essentially weaponized Ebola. William and Philip will share a disillusionment with their handlers, and now that one wrong move with a vial could unleash a premature biological terror attack with them as patient zero, the stakes have never been higher. If there's any mission that needs to be aborted, it's this one. Tens of thousands of people start losing pus all over the streets of DC. So it's safe in my house. What do you want me to say? The Americans really hits its stride in season four. The compelling narrative through line from season two is merged with the more emotionally compelling, weighty character explorations from season three. But I didn't have the same experience I had with season three where I'm waiting for things to pay off that never do. You better believe both Chekhov's plague vials are getting cracked open by somebody before the credits roll. How close did you get to him? We touched him. He was coughing. There was blood. He must have fallen. But in the grand scheme of the American season four, biological warfare is small potatoes. Everybody's chickens come home to roost this year, as events set in motion a long time ago finally reach their conclusion. We lost Annalise in season three along with a handful of series arc players, but the only main character so far to bite the bullet was Stan's old partner Chris Amador. And Amador wasn't the most compelling character. He liked to hump women, and he loved affairs. It was like all he talked about. Damn Stan. You should have an affair sometime. I love affairs. I love having regular sex, and I have it all the time, but affairs are even better. I want to get married like you one day, Stan, just so I can have an affair. Then we get to season four, and characters we've known for years start dropping like flies. The main cast turns into an everything must go sale. Even characters who don't wind up meeting the Grim Reaper wind up targets of the deportation fairy. The first to have their number come up is Nina. After a futile effort to get a letter to Anton Baklanov's son, her sentence of death is reinstated. И будет переведен в исполнение в ближайшее время. Damn. They really did mean shortly. Nina's life behind the eight ball finally comes to a bleak end. It's exactly as depressing as they want it to be, which is a lot. Why this wasn't just part of the season three finale, I don't know. Next, we have the main event of the season, the unmasking of Martha as the mole within the FBI, and Martha's discovery that Philip is a KGB officer. I mean words escape me. It's all so beautiful. Stan's validated suspicions, Philip's desperate bid to exfiltrate her, Elizabeth's resentment of Philip's genuine feelings, Gad's utter horror at what went on under his watch. This is an end time scenario and every performance sells it. Martha? Mm -hmm. Why'd they draw her? Misunderstanding. Didn't know we knew her. But no performance sells it more than Allison Wright as Martha. Being coached by Philip to throw the feds off her trail, she puts on a hell of a show, but the pressure still gets to be more than she can bear. In a sad sort of panic, she runs away with no real plan or possibility of escape. The KGB and the FBI scramble to be the first to grab her, with the Jennings ultimately tracking her down first. They coordinate her exfiltration, and Philip breaks the bad news that he's not coming with her. So sweet, innocent Martha gets shanghaied to the Soviet Union. Poor, trusting Martha, whose only crime was wanting to be loved. Well, that and treason, but you know what I mean. I'll be alone. Just the way it was before I met you. Sorry, I think I got something in my eye. Listen, I know award shows are all bullshit, but it's criminal that Alison Wright didn't get an Emmy nomination for her work in season four. It's such a captivating storyline, and she's the linchpin. And after she's shipped off, the total party kill continues. Oleg tips off the FBI about the biological weapons plot, then flees the country. Gad is forced to retire, then is accidentally killed in an ill-conceived recruiting effort. And Arkady is forced to retire, then PNG'd. Having one of your officers marry his secretary, which is the lowest thing I have seen in my entire life. And now this, you're being expelled from the country. 
And as promised, someone catches loss of fever. Our unfortunate recipient is the bitter biological warfare spy William. Not only does he break the vial to avoid capture and interrogation as the feds surround him, but it's also the one thing he can do for the world that will make the last 25 years of his life matter. Loss of fever is the shiny new toy the Soviet Union wants to play with. William knows it'll be safer on his corpse in a biohazard graveyard than in the hands of his misguided masters. So William takes the hard way out, describing in excruciating detail how his vital Vital organs will liquefy and stream out of his anus as the infection takes hold. Seconds after putting that vile mental image in our heads, Agent Adderholt takes the opportunity to play good cop in my favorite moment of the series. Would you like a Coke? <laughs> William's deathbed reflections in the season finale are captivating. He smiles as he recalls the auspicious beginnings, but laments that he opted out of having a fake wife when they started fighting. He's envious of Philip, wishes he hadn't let her go, wishes she'd been there for all those years, just to have something. It's not like you can go out to the bar and find somebody new, not when you can't even trust a friend with the secrets you're carrying. It's a scary insight into the loneliness of this world, only accentuated by the tragic fate of Martha Hansen earlier in the run. I'd say there were a lot of times I got what the Americans was going for, but season four was the first time I truly connected with the emotions swirling around the series. It's also, not coincidentally, the first time I felt like the Americans was more than just a really good show. This is some must-watch television. The absence of closeness makes you dry inside. But still committed. It was the only thing we had left. All those deaths and characters written off the series, but the one unlikely character who survives until the end is good old Pastor Tim. Rolling the dice on being able to keep him quiet, the Jennings give Paige her first mission. Buddy up to Pastor Tim so he keeps his big mouth shut. Ironically, late in the season when their handler says, Sorry everything got so fucked up this year, how about a seven month break from the spycraft? The only person who doesn't get a break is Paige. She still has to keep working Pastor Tim and his wife. I also appreciate that the show doesn't send Pastor Tim to meet his maker, either by the Jennings hand or a contrived coincidence. A lot of other shows can't resist cheaply killing off an unwanted secret holder immediately after milking a quick cliffhanger out of them. Yes, I'm playing the Dokes clip again, and no, I will never let this go. If I had to choose a negative for this season, is that Oleg is just kind of there? He really doesn't get up to much, just visits his parents, dates a new girl, then gives Stan the bioweapons tip at the end. After plenty of conniving and scheming in the previous two seasons, it's a shame to see him on the back burner, especially since we see quite a lot of him on the back burner. So that's it on season four. Actually, damn, I almost forgot about the young he plot. Elizabeth makes a friend, forges a genuine connection with her, all while we wait for the other shoe to drop and Elizabeth to be forced to do something terrible to her which boy does she. More fuel for the thematic fire of feigned relationships in lieu of real ones, the pain of ruining the life of an innocent asset you consider a good person, and the ultimate crushing loneliness after the job is done. A crushing loneliness that Paige will soon become accustomed to when Philip catches her mackin' on Stan Beeman's son and puts a stop to it as the credits roll. Dad! You have no idea. No idea. The premiere of season five sees loss of fever back on the table sooner than expected. Not respecting William's dying wishes, the Jennings are tasked with digging up his sealed steel coffin and hacking a slice of salami off William's infected corpse. This leaves the already disillusioned Philip wondering even further, are we the baddies? But when they learn of a possible conspiracy by the US government to introduce pests into the Soviet wheat supply and starve people, the Jennings get back in the saddle and go on a quest with zero moral ambiguity. It's time to dismantle the experiment and feed the world, and if anybody has to be killed along the way, they're just bad guys who have it coming. This gung-ho attitude is encouraged by their latest undercover ally Tuan, who plays the part of adopted son and is a tanky piece of shit. It's his homeland, where he comes from. Don't know how you people let a guy like that get out. He should have put a bullet in his head a long time ago. Philip and Elizabeth each get a mark within the wheat conspiracy while Tuan works a fellow kid at his high school. Philip is distraught to learn that the Americans are actually making bug-resistant wheat to feed the world, as opposed to making bugs that will starve the world. Whoops, looks like you killed an innocent person. 
again. You should have asked. Please, I... Meanwhile, Oleg investigates corruption within the Soviet Union's food supply chain, and Stan attempts to recruit some local assets. And that's really all I feel I need to cover on the plot lines of this season. There is something more important we need to talk about first. The show's writers Joel Fields and Joe Weisberg openly admitted in interviews that season 5 of The Americans was going for something different with its pacing. They jokingly referred to the show as going from slow burn to not even burning, just warm embers. And holy mother of god, am I inclined to agree. Season 3 was already an experiment in deliberate pacing, but if both seasons are experiments, and slow burns, season 3 is like a baking soda volcano while season 5 is the Manhattan Project. It is interminable. This is coming from a man with plenty of experience with slow moving shows. I've seen lots of seasons of television that test my patience, but ultimately come together in some sort of spectacular and rewarding fashion that makes the journey seem worthwhile. I'm also a diehard fan of the slow simmering Better Call Saul, and my favorite season is probably the fourth one. You know, the most boring one. The one where Jimmy works in a cell phone store and Mike spends the whole year digging a hole in the ground. Better Call Saul has tons of sequences solely designed to show you boring and monotonous aspects of their careers and lives. It executes this with stylistic editing and a score that conveys the emotions they want to inspire. Meanwhile, when the American season 5 wants to show you how lengthy and arduous digging up a coffin is, they do so by making you watch people dig a hole for 5 minutes. Not that the rest of the plot going forward is much more engaging than people digging a big hole. I tend to be a sort of autistic savant when it comes to remembering what happened in each hour of a TV show just by looking at the episode title, but even fresh off my watch of the series, I'm stumped on half of these. I imagine that's because for much of the season, mostly the same things are happening each episode. Training Paige, Super Bugs, Elizabeth's Mark is Charming, Phillips Mark is Not, Tuan's Gonna Bully the Kid, Stan Tries to Recruit Someone, We Want to Blackmail Oleg, Oleg Investigates a Grocer, Why Are They Investigating Me, Training Paige, Super Wheat, Charming Mark, Phillips Sucks, Bully the Kid, Stan Goes recruiting. I don't want you to blackmail Oleg. Oleg investigates a grocer. Why are they investigating me? Paige is training more. Let's talk about weed. Elizabeth Mark. Philip Mark. I got some bullies to bully the kid with poop. You better not blackmail Oleg. The grocer I investigated led to a different grocer I can investigate. Why is the KGB investigating me? Is Stan's girlfriend KGB? I don't know. Investigate a grocer. KGB investigates me. Is Stan's girlfriend KGB? I don't know. Let's talk about wheat some more. Then we'll train Paige some more. We decided not to blackmail Oleg. Oh wait, we, we want to blackmail Oleg again. Gad would want us to blackmail Oleg in his memory, which is why Oleg is under investigation. But I already knew that, but I'm gonna have another scene where Oleg pretends he didn't know that and asks somebody why he's under investigation again. Tai Chi with Wheat Man, Wheat Girl Bad. Is Stan's girlfriend KGB? I don't know, you figure it out. This goes on for the span of a full 13 episode season, two hours longer than the extended Lord of the Rings trilogy. The first season of The Americans could have probably fit all this material into the span of three episodes. I feel kind of bad, even ungrateful, for being so down on it. The performances are grounded, the writing is natural, and this tedious slow pace was the intention of the showrunners. It was their intention and they successfully pulled it off. I mean, hey, good for them, but just because they succeeded at making the thing they wanted to make doesn't mean making it was a good idea. Nikocado Avocado successfully makes mukbang videos, but it doesn't mean I want to fucking watch them. I'm not too worried about hurting any of the creators' feelings, though, since this season was absolutely showered with critical praise. But why? What am I missing? For the first time in one of these retrospectives, I decided to look around at other reviews and see what people were getting out of it that I wasn't. Mostly people seem to latch on to one or two standout scenes and gush about those each episode. For what it's worth, yeah. I've been very hard in the season, but it's not all bad. The Jennings finally let Paige peek behind the curtain of what they do. They introduce her to kindly handler Gabriel before he returns to Russia. They give her some combat training to put her mind at ease. They take a third option to get rid of Pastor Tim via arranging a dream job abroad for him and then let her know about their efforts to feed their people and the unsung so-called heroics of their work. Also known as the stuff they should have been doing when the Russian Revelation Iron was still hot. And when the show does something totally weird, Weird, it makes for great moments. There's the weird darkroom est voiceover, which really plants the seeds of Philip's morphing worldview. Gabriel's wordless realization that it's time to retire, backdrop by the Lincoln Memorial, is touching. There's a full shotgun Russian Orthodox ceremony as Philip and Elizabeth decide to get legitimately married by their real names. There's an extended sequence where they interrogate a possible Nazi collaborator in hiding that oozes tension. Tuan goes off script and is like, yeah, I convinced the high school kid to fake a suicide, but if he 
he screws up and dies for real. Who gives a shit? There's the one minute long scene of Oleg's family awkwardly eating dinner where nobody talks, which actually made me laugh out loud. Like, what is this? There's this whole thing where over the course of half the season, Philip's son sneaks his way into America only to be turned back by Gabriel when he arrives in DC. That was a pretty daring choice for how to resolve that plot line. He returns home without Philip ever knowing they were in the same zip code. It's sad and satisfyingly disappointing, which I know is a contradiction. It would have been easier to appreciate this resolution if we weren't already starved for drama by this point in the season. But I come for him. You understand? I do. These are neat moments, but they're just moments. There's not enough emotional thrust in them to carry an entire season. For me, there isn't even enough there to carry the respective episodes. In the third to last episode, the Jennings get roped into killing yet another innocent person, and they basically sit in the car after and go, are you done? Because I'm... I'm gonna be honest, I'm kinda done. Let's call it quits, let's go back to Russia. So the two-on mission comes to an end. He tries to chew them out for their petty bourgeoisie concerns. Elizabeth notices a bit of herself in the hardline young twerp and says he'll need to find a partner if he's ever gonna have a hope of evening himself out and making it in this line of work. You need someone, Tuan. A partner. To do this with, to get through it with. Yeah, too, on. Maybe you should stop worrying about our petty bourgeoisie concerns and start worrying about getting some bitches. Philip crushes Henry's dreams of going to a prestigious boarding school, and the Jennings make plans to steal away to Russia with their unwitting children. Goodbye, DC. Goodbye, Claudia. Goodbye, missions. Goodbye, Kimmy. Goodbye, Tuan. Goodbye, Wheat Hippie. Goodbye, house. Goodbye, car. Goodbye, racquetball with Stan. Goodbye, Schrodinger's secret agent. It's an effective and emotional end montage to wrap up the season. Although, setting it to goodbye Yellow Brick Road is borderline cheating. I'd get emotional to any finale set to Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. They could have played it during the Aqua Teen Hunger Force finale and my eyes would have welled up. Then Philip overhears Kimmy's dad got promoted to head of the Soviet division. So they have to stay. Oh. Okay. So nothing of consequence happened all season. Great. It's a day of big disappointments for all of us. I had a moment of clarity near the tail end of the season. It had been a tiring day at work, the gym was crowded, the drive home was lengthy. I sat on the couch and thought to myself, I better watch another episode of The Americans so I can finish my video. And then I thought to myself, would I bother finishing the fifth season of The Americans if I hadn't promised to make a retrospective video on it? And the answer is no. I did not enjoy this season of television. I did not enjoy the wheat honey trap plot that kept going even after they acquired the MacGuffin. I can't imagine there's a soul alive who enjoyed the grocery supply chain mystery with Oleg. It's a grocery supply chain. It's exactly as exciting as it sounds. And I certainly didn't need the perfunctory happy ending for Martha where she gets to adopt a child in Russia. Just have her in that one shot in the grocery store as Oleg leaves. That's all we needed. That was perfect. Anyways, I think I've expressed my dissatisfaction for the fifth season long enough for everyone to realize I'm just a smooth brain critic who doesn't get it. Let's hop over to the sixth and final season and see what all the fuss is about. Sometimes after a disappointing season, TV shows have to put in a lot of legwork to get me back on board, but that is not really the case with The Americans. I have plenty of goodwill banked, and the final season only runs a tight 10 episodes as opposed to the usual 13. When the biggest issue I've had with the series has been the occasionally languid pacing, this is a promising change. Also promising that we get into the action right away. We've done another time skip, so Paige is in college, Stan married Renee, the maybe possibly could be spy woman, Philip is out of the game and working full time as a travel agent, and Elizabeth Elizabeth is getting awfully run down by having to do this without him. Paige is also a part of the team now, assisting in stakeouts and recon, but still with training wheels on. Don't tell her we kill people, and don't tell her we screw people. He was troubled. He killed himself. Mom tried to stop him. Why did he kill himself, Elizabeth? I'm sure there was a reason. Also got a chuckle out of me that after four seasons of always questioning her parents' actions and being a religious goody two-shoes, all it took was a couple years of college to turn her into an avowed communist spy. There's a joke in there somewhere. Also helping kick things off in an engaging manner, instead of bouncing around about what the season's main narrative will be, the central conceit of the final showdown is spelled out to the audience by Arcady within the first 15 minutes. Some big peace summit is going down in DC, and people within the center want to sabotage it and unseat Gorbachev. 
Oleg, are you a bad enough dude to travel to the U.S. without diplomatic immunity and stop the coup? Meanwhile, Elizabeth is roped into the anti-Gorbachev conspiracy and must get her hands on nuclear dead hand technology so the arms race can continue. Her blind loyalty to the cause means she doesn't care about the means and knows not to ask about the ends. But little does she know that Oleg's first point of contact will be her own husband, that retired old softy. We want you to find out what your wife is doing and tell us. And if you have to stop her. Let's fucking go. Oleg's off the bench, Paige is in the game, Philip's gotta work his own wife, and Elizabeth is off the leash and going full on Russian Terminator. No, not that one. I've got my popcorn bucket, cell phones off, take your seats and we'll spend a thrilling 10 hours at the fireworks factory. Philip and Elizabeth's marriage has been strained before, but it's really hitting the rocks now. Elizabeth has redoubled her dedication to her mission in Philip's absence, and it plays out almost like an analog of a spouse who's a workaholic. It's also neatly displayed in the cyanide necklace she's issued during the season premiere. Elizabeth, this job is literally going to kill you. Come to think of it, even the conclusion of the Sabotage That Summit story fits that workaholic narrative. Elizabeth stands up to her hand Handler after getting wise to the plot and Claudia fires back like a typical bad boss. How could you do this to us? We, we were going to do great things and you're ruining it. With zero acknowledgement of all the bullshit they put you through that drove you to quit in the first place. The work you put in, the sacrifices you made, our time with Paige, it was all for nothing, Elizabeth. Speaking of bad bosses, let's check in with Philip, the saddest man on television. Seriously, I think the only time I've seen him smile is when he's out country line dancing. Oh, Philip. With an empty nest, no missions to run, and a spouse who's always out and about, Philip doubled down on his travel agency business and the expansion is obviously hemorrhaging money. This has disturbingly transformed Philip into a combination of Michael Scott and Willie Loman, in some scenes that are blackly comedic, but also downright painful to witness. He's a broken man. I talked about what an exclusive deal we were offering. Value, all right, value, value. One. Further driving the wedge between him and his wife, Paige has taken over the family business of Spycraft. It's a family business that essentially destroyed his soul though, so he is not pleased with that turn of events at all. Nor is he happy with effectively becoming the third wheel whenever Paige drops by. The whole family is on a need to know basis now and Philip and Henry both don't need to know. They just have to get used to conversations awkwardly ending as soon as they're within earshot. So while Paige is further indoctrinated day by day, Henry has finally left the Jennings madhouse for the first time in his life to attend board school. When he comes back, he has more perspective on how weird the dynamics are. It's nothing show-stealing, but I really enjoyed the way Henry was used this season. Much like Walt Jr., he sort of became a plot device as the series went on. An innocent child, only seen over the breakfast table, whose inevitable discovery of the truth hangs over the main characters like the Sword of Damocles. In the final season, Henry has evolved into his own person in an organic way, and I appreciate that the show never slapped in some sort of social hurdles, drug use, or beat up the bully sea stories in a lazy bid to try and flesh him out. And given his budding friendship with Stan, born of Stan's difficulty connecting with his own family rooted all the way back in season one, it only makes sense that Henry would be the one to accidentally give Stan the last puzzle piece he needed to put together that Philip and Elizabeth are illegals. It's a quietly tense and fascinating scene. Elizabeth vanishes on Thanksgiving, supposedly for work, then Philip follows right after her. The pair's performances are great. Stan starts off just trying to make conversation, but you can see the moment the switch flips in his mind and he goes, oh shit. And Henry is so comfortable with Stan and so aghast at his parents' awkward behavior that he doesn't even notice when the conversation turns on a dime from small talk to interrogation. Must be pretty important. Always is. This kind of thing happened a lot. It's another example of the understated and down-to-earth nature of this trench coat style spy thriller. Stan doesn't stumble on damning evidence by accident in the final scene before the credits so we can have a big cliffhanger. The revelation occurs during casual conversation in a seemingly mundane scene, which gels with Stan's characterization. Eventually all the lies that Jennings spin just aren't going to add up. So while Philip comes back on board with Elizabeth for one last mission, Paige jumps off board after learning Elizabeth puts out to get information, and Oleg, who only wanted to help the world, gets pinched for espionage. Stan starts to work his theory and takes us into the finale. Philip and Elizabeth Jennings are not Russian spies. I know it sounds crazy, Dennis. Right off the bat, the Russian priest who married Philip and Elizabeth in season five gets made. 
during a meeting with Philip. The party is over, Philip Jennings. There's a dead guy in the pool, and that dead guy is you. Philip is able to evade capture, but now it's only a matter of time. He calls Elizabeth and gives her the bug out code. The first big decision of the finale is if they can risk snatching up Henry or not. He's all the way at boarding school, and his phone could be tapped already, depending on what info the priest gave up. Smartly, this isn't just a question of difficulty. Philip also makes the compelling argument that, much like himself, Henry fits in here. Painful as it is for a parent to admit, he states that the innocent Henry will be better off without all of them. I don't understand. How's he gonna live? Who's gonna pay for his college? Is he gonna be able to get a job? This is hard for all of us. We all love Henry, okay? Yeah, do you? While the FBI continues to interrogate the priest, one of their agents goes rogue with a theory of his own. Suspecting that Jennings' parents would stop for Paige on their way out of town, Stan elects to confront them alone. I appreciate that this isn't the typical anti-villain drama trope where the close friend or family within law enforcement attempts to head off the agency to preserve their own career. Stan already came forward with his suspicions and the Bureau refused to pursue them. This is just Stan doubling down on his bet and winning. And Sophia, that was you. Who is that? We don't, we don't know who that is. Fucking liar. I saw it on your face. Despite occurring with half the episode still to go, the parking garage confrontation is the climax of the spy storyline, the standout sequence of the episode, and the signature scene of the series. Phillips starts by denying everything, then is forced to admit that Stan is right, but Phillips has been retired for some time, he appeals to Stan's friendship, he desperately explains that with Oleg behind bars, the Jennings are the only ones left to prevent the ousting Gorbachev plot, and he makes a statement that echoes both journeys throughout the series about asking whether the people issuing your orders are doing the right thing. It's a lengthy conversation, but it also flies by, since you're dreading things coming to a violent end and hanging on every word. It's also a clever choice to have many of Philip's emotional appeals fall on deaf ears, or even backfire. And then we ended up as friends. Friends. You made my life a joke. Stan's equally heartbroken and vengeful, unable to make up his mind on whether he should feel pathetic or righteously vindicated, and Noah Emmerich really gets to sink his teeth into this juicy showdown. At the end of the day, it isn't power of friendship or invoking his children or some cheesy arc words thrown back at Stan. In fact, it's kind of hard to tell which element of Philip's begging for his life was the one that got him off the hook. With tensions sky high and pulses still pounding, the Jennings sans Henry pop on their disguises, enjoy one last American meal at McDonald's, Donald's and hop a train for Canada. Aside from a brief scene where the FBI finally identifies the Jennings and a crushing just called to say hello for the last time phone call to Henry, the rest of the finale is almost entirely wordless. That previous montage was set to Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits. Then comes the climax of the familial drama, as the Jennings family successfully make it across the border, only to notice Paige has chosen to stay behind as she passes their windows. Philip and Elizabeth watch, powerless, as she disappears from their lives forever. Stan breaks the news to Henry, and Paige camps out at Claudia the Handler's now abandoned apartment, necking vodka left behind during Claudia's hasty retreat, not knowing what sort of music she'll have to face for her involvement in her parents' treason. This is all set to U2's With or Without You. It's the most tragic thing set to Bono music since Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. For the final musical touch, the somber journey of the Jennings parents back to Moscow by plane, train, and automobile is set to Tchaikovsky's None But the Lonely Heart. With all the threads of the Americans more or less tied up, the long journey home is more about just wallowing in the sadness of it all. The Jennings family has been utterly broken, with Philip and Elizabeth's love hot off their biggest rift yet, and little do they know that in less than four years, the USSR will collapse, the KGB will be disbanded, and the cause they've been fighting for has already been lost. Well done, good job, but sorry old boy, everything you risked your life and limb for has changed. Would you like a Coke? So that's The Americans. It's a very well thought out and very serious show, with nuanced performances and a final season that more than lives up to the hype. It's not a show for everyone. Until some sort of trimmed down, the Hobbit-esque fan edit comes out for season five, I'm hesitant to recommend the series willy-nilly to just anybody. But if it sounds like it suits your particular tastes, you might just have the same realization Stan Beeman did in the final season. What if the real spies were the friends we made along the way?